just ask you to kick off with, with a kind of general um, uh, 30 seconds to a minute on where you think we are with low carbon, if there's anything particularly that's going right, if there's anything particularly that's going wrong and needs to be fixed. And if you could just start by introducing yourself. Well, good afternoon. I'm trying to keep everybody awake after a very sumptuous lunch. And thank you very much, Jasmine, for your introduction. My name is Iz Branho. I'm the managing director for BYD Europe. We are based in Rotterdam. BYD started as a battery manufacturer. We started producing vehicles about 12 years ago, and we've been in the UK market since about 2013. What is wrong, what is right? Everything is wrong, everything is right. There's a lot of opponents, there are a lot of proponents out in the public right now. We have, in the last seven years, been launching electric vehicles. And it's been a spectacular event for us. And there's been a lot of people saying that this is the greatest. Our two test vehicles that started in 2013, working together with Go Ahead Bus, were able to save the fuel costs from 90 pounds diesel a day to about 12 pounds charging. So that's right, financially speaking, okay? We've been talking to a lot of energy companies, energy distribution companies, software company, IT company, working together to make the system smarter for the operators. I mean, what do the bus people know about IT and electric? It's a very conservative industry, the bus industry. They don't want anything changed. But the change is in the air. We need to help them. So that's good. But what's wrong? Well, the depots are wrong. They're all located in the wrong position. They're nowhere close to the grid. They didn't need to. They need to be close to a petrol station. OK, so that's wrong. The grid in the UK, it's relatively dated. They need to be updated. So that's wrong. We don't have, we have a lot of support from the government. But when it comes to the operation level, the money is not there. The operator not seeing the kind of push for the infrastructure. Purchasing the asset is one thing, but supporting that asset to run day to day on the road needs government support. So that is wrong. Okay. So we have a lot of rights and a lot of wrongs, and I think if we work together, we can make more rights than the wrongs. Fiona. Hi, Fiona Howarth. I run Octopus Electric Vehicles. Octopus Electric Vehicles is part of the Octopus Energy Group. For those of you that don't know, we launched Octopus Energy about three years ago, now have about 700,000 customers, and we have completely built our own CRM and billing platform, which means that we can do really cool, innovative tariffs. And specifically, that applies to the EV sector, because we've offered tariffs now with like Octopus Energy Go. You can get very cheap electricity overnight uh, for four hours a night, 5p per kilowatt hour. But then there's also other ones where you can do time of use throughout the night and throughout the day, which actually, back to your point earlier, enables us to manage that grid a lot more effectively as we start to, to bring EVs onto the network. Now, actually, we found out that it was quite difficult sometimes to find electric cars for people to test drive and to experience. And so we also started to look at that space, and that's where we've got Octopus Electric Vehicles, where we actually enable people to come and find out about electric cars, test drive them, and now we specialize in leasing, and we offer a bundle. So we offer an EV lease, a charge point for your home or also your business. We can do it for your workplace. And then also specialist energy tariffs. And we bundle that together. And then you've got specialist expert advice as you want to get on the road. In terms of how, we th how I think we're doing, yeah. I think we could be doing a lot better, if I'm honest. Um, what we find, I'm going to steal Ian's stats. I'm so sorry. I keep on doing this. <laughs> Go um, ahead. But Auto Trader did some, did some research. <laughs> And they found a couple of years ago there was about 25% of the UK car owners thought they were going to maybe take their next car as electric. Now it's nearly three quarters. They did, did the research again earlier this year, and it's 71%. There is so much appetite in the UK now to switch to electric cars. And you know what? There are some really good cars out there. So whether it be the Nissan Leaf, which is, which is a really brilliant car. If you haven't driven electric, please do go and drive on. Um, but then there's you know, the Teslas that are coming out, the Model 3s that are hitting the shores right now. But there are some other ones that we can't get our hands on. And actually, there's very low volume of them. And right now is the time for us to make a massive change, right? So if you take emissions across the UK, they've gone down over the last few years by 40%, over 40%. Mm. 
in the transport sector, they've barely moved. They've gone down by 3%. And actually, if we're going to hit net zero, we absolutely need to make a stand right now, and we need to get stronger on doing this, and we need to like start bringing those vehicles to the UK. The appetite is here, and, uh, and, and it would be great to get more of them. Mm. Um, hi, I'm Chris Stark. I'm the Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change. So we're the UK's watchdog on climate change. Um, and a few weeks ago, at the start of May, we produced a report on this net zero target, which she just referred to, um, which is the culmination of a lot of work that we've been doing in the committee over the last um, seven or eight months. And um, it feels like a really important time to be doing that. So um, very, very briefly, um, the, the, the global position on climate change is not a very pretty one at the moment. So there are some um, very worrying trends that have been uh, very difficult to move for a number of years. Um, and put simply, what the world needs to do over the next 30 to 40 years is get to a point where globally emissions stop and we get to a global position of net zero, as it's known. And if we don't, we will continue to warm the earth. And um, there's all sorts of things that will happen very shortly that I think should trouble us all. Here in the UK, we need to be part of that story too. So the, the request that we took from ministers last October was to look at whether we had the right target for emissions reduction. And we concluded in May that the appropriate target would be a net zero target and that we could do that by 2050. And one of the reasons why I am very excited about our ability to meet that target is because of the things that you in this room understand better than anyone else. Um, and for me, that means a sector known as surface transport, which at the moment is the UK's worst sector for emissions, but which has all the hallmarks of a sector that is ripe for very rapid uh, disruption. Um, and we can see this kind of culmination of events happening, and we do this work in the committee. We look at this, uh, we look out to mid-century and ask what, when, what might the world look like? And what we see is a system of energy here in the UK that is increasingly using very cheap renewable energy, um, cheaper than fossil fuels, even when you look on a whole system basis, coupled with very cheap battery technology, which has been coming down remarkably in price, which is making electric vehicles look like very quickly they will become cheaper um, than fossil fuel vehicles, never mind climate policy. So it looks like we are on the cusp of something which would drive emissions in what is presently our biggest sector very quickly downwards, something that previously we've always felt would be one of the tougher, the tougher sectors to tackle, now looks like a sector that might actually be able to tackle in a way that is cost beneficial to the, to the economy. So it's a really exciting moment. And just as you've been hearing, that story of emissions reduction in surface transport goes very well with this idea of a much smarter energy system. The smarter our energy system is overall, the more that we have flexible demand for electricity, the more that we can build in cheap renewables and marry those two things up. So there's a really important story here, which is about disruption and emissions reduction in the UK, coupling together energy and transport. And that, I think, is just wonderful to be able to talk about um, and not something that we could have predicted 10 years ago when we first had the Climate Change Act. So I'm very pleased that tomorrow, if things go to plan, we will have a net zero target here in the UK. And I'm very pleased that surface transport will be one of the main reasons that we can achieve it. Alex. Um, Alex Smith, Managing Director of Volkswagen Group in the UK. So we're the importer for Volkswagen passenger cars, Volkswagen commercial vehicles, Audi, Seat and Skoda. Um, Chris, you've used the right word in exciting. Uh, I think that uh, it's a hugely exciting time. Volkswagen Group has, uh, has committed to the aims of the Paris Climate Protection Agreement, which means net zero by, by 2050, uh, and is investing 30 billion in electrification uh, through to 2023. So we're talking 22 million vehicles to be produced in the next decade on the, uh, the MEV platform. So we're right at the edge of something hugely exciting. Um, we've got the opportunity to, to do something really quite amazing to contribute to, to climate protection. Um, but I think probably we need a little bit of help, uh, help in infrastructure, help in regulation, help in incentivization. I think those are some things we might debate this afternoon. Which we have been saying, actually, for some years when I've been doing this, we've been saying the same thing, particularly about infrastructure. 
and charging infrastructure, actually. And, and yeah, charging anxiety. So on that one particular thing of charging infrastructure, mm. have you seen, for instance, since last year or the year before that, have you seen real progress uh, either actually in rollout or in at least a bankable promise of rollout? Yes, we've seen progress. We've seen entrepreneurial progress. I, I, I'm not sure that we've seen coordinated progress. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, at Volkswagen, we've, we've partnered with Tesco. Uh, Tesco will install 2,400 charging points, which will be publicly available in Tesco stores, which is tremendous. It increases the number of public charging points available in this country by 14%. It's a good step. Um, we're a partnership in a joint venture in a company called Ionity, who are introducing 35 rapid charging stations in the UK, close to highways. Um, so we're involved. Lots of other stakeholders are involved. Um, but at the moment, I think there's more that can be done in terms of uh, assessing demand yeah. and planning how it's going to roll out to the, the best benefit of the public. Ian. Thank you. I'm Ian Plummer. I'm Commercial Director at Autotrader. Um, the good news is I share the excitement of my colleagues on the panel. I think it's a fascinating time to be working in this industry. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of a lot of change. Everyone talks about... You know, this is the big, biggest period of change we'll be facing in the industry for X years, but it really does feel that way. I think for a market to change, to really move, you often need one strong force for change, but it feels like there's at least three. I see, obviously, a regulatory sort of uh, context, which is pushing change, um, a, a consumer, which is demanding change, and technology, which is enabling it. Bringing those three into play at one time, I think, really puts us in, a, in an exciting place where we can make things happen quickly. Um, I think... What I'm looking for now is where we're going to get to the tipping point where we can hopefully see really strong volumes of, uh, of these electric vehicles that are coming into the market and hopefully tr providing a supply-led opportunity to um, uh, take advantage, I suggest, of the point that Fiona made around the demand-led situation, which is already very strong. Appetite is good for electric cars. Mm -hmm. And if we can get to that tipping point, we really can get on the, the road to progress towards the challenges that you pointed out, Chris. Mm. I was fascinated by something our, our previous speaker was talking about, the, the ability of these vehicles, of the vans, to get to uh, zero emissions, but then actually n not to be where you don't need it to be and you're not in a city. I mean, is, is that sort of flexibility something that is, is, is the future of the sector? Because we, we tend to, I think the public view is you either have an electric vehicle or you, you have a hybrid and it's all the time working on both, as it were. But this idea that you can sort of switch on completely and switch off completely, what, what do you think of that, Fiona? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a plug-in hybrid, isn't it? And I think if we're committed to going to net zero, we need to go to zero emissions cars. And what we found with people that take them, potentially they might take them as a second vehicle, right? If you have two cars, then actually, why not try an electric car as your second one, and then your first one you can use for longer journeys? And what we find is very quickly that becomes the first car in the family. And actually, the next time they switch out that, that second car, which is the old internal combustion engine, that then becomes electric as well. So actually, if we get people into electric cars and they start to love them, and actually we'll see that continuing. And actually, what we found there with plug-in hybrids is that, sadly, some people weren't even plugging them in, so they didn't learn the kind of how to actually live with an electric car in their lives. So actually, they never made that step. Whereas actually, if they get into an electric car and they start using it fully, they love it and they don't go back. Mm. What about the grid, which you brought out right, right at the beginning? And I think I've also heard discussed in, in previous years. Are we getting anywhere when it comes to sorting out and thinking about how the grid copes with demand? Oh. Do you want Are you? To? I'm happy to well, take, take Both take it. What? Go first. Well, I mean, a good example, right? I'm going to give you some stats. So the national grid, I think I spotted someone here earlier, Graham. Uh, National Grid, in their future energy scenarios, estimate there might be up to 11 million EVs on the road in the UK by 2030. Let's say all of them go home, because most people will plug in at home. It's a bit like your mobile phone. You'll plug in overnight, start your day with a full charge. Everyone will go home. Let's say they get home at 6 o'clock. Irish, but, you know, get home at 6 o'clock, plug in your car. <laughs> 11 million, all charging up. A standard rate is 7 kilowatts. 7 kilowatts, 11 million cars. That's 77 gigawatts of energy consumption just going into those cars. At the minute, our peak energy consumption in the UK is 62 gigawatts. So actually, we've just more than doubled our consumption, and that peak consumption by the happens between 4 and 7 p.m. 
So that's the same time when you get home and you probably plug in your car. So actually, if we don't make it smart, if we don't make it clever, then there might be a challenge there. Mm. Right? Our grid is not set up to deal with that, and there would be a lot of infrastructure upgrade needed. However, Ofgem, uh, the regulator in the energy sector, had a look at this, and they thought, actually, though, with smart charging and smart infrastructure, we can save up to £40 billion pounds worth of investment over the next couple of decades. And what that means is actually you don't charge up straight when you get home, you charge up in the middle of the night when it's off-peak time, when everyone's sleeping. I mean, potentially the wind is blowing then. It's, you know, back to your point, Chris, renewables are intermittent, they're unreliable, but actually you can start to marry them together now. So you can store it in your electric car when there's a lot of energy onto the grid. And then you can use it when there's not as much energy, but people are using it at home. So actually, we're doing a lot in vehicle to grid at the minute, mm. where actually we store it when it's cheap overnight, and then we can feed it back to the house and to the grid from the car battery uh, at yeah. peak times. Yeah. So actually, with that kind of smarts, that, that cleverness, we can actually yeah. totally mitigate a lot of the infrastructure challenges that we yeah. would be facing. So a lot of it is about flexibility, isn't it? And, and imagining ways of doing things that, 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 that are not... You know. and, uh, d is government kind of plugged in to, to that flexibility, do you think, from your position as an I, I, mean, I, I think they, I think they are. I, I think, if, uh, if I'm being honest, I think government is, is bewildered by the size of the task. Um, so, you know, it's great when I can present a report to, part, to government and to parliament that says it's possible to do it, but it's very different to actually doing it. You know, that's the thing that government's now wrestling with. I mean, to give you a sense of how big this transition would be to net zero, um, in, the, in the kind of scenarios that we were, we were discussing in the report at the start of May, to get to net zero would involve a doubling of the size of the electricity system in the UK. And the, the reason that it needs to double in size is because of all the new transport and potentially heating demands that we'll have. That's, that's perfectly possible over the next 30 years or so, but it does involve a lot of investment and that needs to be well planned. And, and just, to, just to echo the points already made, the more that that uh, new demand is smart and flexible, the cheaper the overall system will be. We have a lot of redundancy in the energy system already at the moment, and this is an opportunity to, to reduce that and, that's a, and to make energy overall cheaper. So there's lots of things that come together that, that happily have the benefit of reducing emissions as well, but it's, it, is, it is also an energy story. Ian? Yeah. Uh, just, just to add to that point, and just challenge it slightly, forgive me, the consumer angle on the, <clears throat> the, the government's action is one of confusion. Mm -hmm. And we're in a situation right now where the, it seems like we're not yet in a Norway type of situation. Most of you know, I'm sure <coughs> that Norway has a far greater level of penetration of electric vehicles than any other market out there. Where they managed to succeed was with a carrot and stick approach. And we seem to have a bit of a stick and uncertainty kind of approach. We have created a level of confusion in the minds of consumers where they don't really understand the fuel debate. And they don't really understand the government's sort of moving goalposts in terms of support, not support. And our research that uh, Fiona mentioned a minute ago showed that nearly 50% of people are actually now slightly confused by what's happening to the degree where they're not consider considering an AFB or EV as they might have been previously. What's confusing? So, what, what is it that, 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 is, that they're thinking might change or is well, it happening? Well, taking back the level of plug-in grant and then and removing it from hybrids just creates a level of sort of well, uncertainty. That's already happened. That's strange. We've got the road to 2040 and that's slightly... Um, contradictory. Mm. And then there's an assumption that, well, if that's happened, something else might happen. So maybe I should sit on my hands and wait for, for a, you know, a, a bit more clarity. Yeah. That, that isn't a conducive yeah. environment to accelerate change. And battery technology is also a feeling that the actual tech in the vehicles is going to change potentially quite largely and so it might be worth waiting. There is definitely a growing level of appetite. I mean, Fiona mentioned earlier, 75% of people are considering uh, electric vehicle for their next change of car. Actually, half of people are expecting the next change of car to be an electric vehicle. When you look at the numbers, though, in terms of action, there's a much greater level of search on our site. We have you know, nearly, nearly as many people are searching on our site, individual searches on our site, than actually buy a new or used car in a whole year, in a given month. So we see what they're doing. They're growing their searches twofold ahead of the rate of actual registrations of cars. So they're, they're looking for this information. And the maker's got to do it. more um, uh, to, to encourage people just mm -hmm. as... We, we, this, the, the very words kind of mobility solution, kind of slightly deadening, aren't they? Driving used to be fun, didn't it? I mean, the, the, the idea of a vehicle that's enjoyable 
to drive. And anyone who does drive an electric vehicle, I mean, it's like driving a high-powered Dodger, isn't it? It's quite fun. I'm glad you in, enjoy in, them. In, 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 in <laughs> London. I think they're great. I mean, yeah. what, and, and, uh, but that, I don't think... I don't think that's necessarily out there. This is kind of slightly deadened kind of, you know, I was going to say sandals and Birkenstocks, but I wasn't going to say <laughs> that. There's this, kind of, there's this kind of feeling about them that they're the right thing to do, but not necessarily the fun thing to do. And I wonder if that, in a commercial way, has also got to change. I think I, look, Volkswagen next, next year um, will bring ID3, the first, the first of the ID uh, family based on the MEB uh, elect electric platform. Um, we'll bring it to market at around the price of a, of a Golf TDI, of a Golf diesel. Um, it will have scalable range. It will be hugely enjoyable to drive. It will be technologically extraordinarily advanced. And I, I think the, the key thing is that there comes a point, and we, we think it's with ID3, where an electric vehicle becomes um, in many ways and um, perhaps in every way a superior choice to an internal mm. combustion engine vehicle. Humans have a habit, when something is demonstrably better than a predecessor, of adopting it like hell. Um, so at the point that, that ID3 arrives, with that scalable range, hugely entertaining to drive, priced equivalent to a Golf TDI, that's the point at, wi at which we think the conversation then just becomes, why not? Um, yeah. and, and that's that's the point where, you know, actually then we'll have to have to be thinking with a, a fair degree of sophistication in terms of ensuring that there's, um, you know, I guess, consistency of incentives, consistency of taxation policy, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a fleet driver choosing an EV today, you do not know what rate of benefit in kind tax you'll be paying <coughs> before the end of a lease, if it's a standard three or four year lease. Yeah. So you don't have any certainty that you're, that, you know, you know you're making the right environmental decision, yeah. um, but you know, you're not necessarily sure that you're making a consistent fiscal decision. Another point that's very important, if I may, mm. is when we bring ID3, we will bring it carbon neutral at the point of handover, which is a, a convoluted way of saying that at, when we hand it over to the customer, that car will be carbon neutral. So we, we will have either eliminated or offset all of the carbon production in the supply chain, in the manufacturing process, in the logistics. What's really key then is that a customer can make it carbon neutral for the, for the car's life. And in, in, uh, for, for that criteria to be met, then we need to be thinking about energy mix. Yeah. Isman, do you agree? It, it, there's got to be some excitement. There's got to be something more than... That just kind of I, I belong to the old school. I think a Triumph TR6 is fun. <laughs> and I'm sure my <laughs> daughter would not agree to that. Well, I think fun to the driving public today is quite different from 30 years ago, isn't it? So the fun factor, other than carbon neutral bit, is very important to the new consumers, the connectivity, okay? In China right now, BYD is at the tipping point of stopping all ICE production and going directly to complete electric vehicles. Okay, and we've been over the last five, for last five years, year on year, being the number one supplier of new energy vehicle, bar none. I think the time has come that we realize that the fun factor has changed in China. And those of whom you've been to China, karaoke is very big. So one of the features in a BYD vehicle in China is karaoke. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about fun, we got to be a little bit ca yeah. careful and yeah. then not to reveal our age. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, all right, fair point. Uh, let's throw it open to anyone who wants to stand there. Yeah, gentleman here, if we can get a microphone down to, down to him. Uh, Daniel Puddicum from Company Cars Today magazine. Um, this is mainly aimed at Alex, but um, if anybody else has any opinions, feel free to. I'd, I'd be interested. A um, couple of questions. One, uh, this time last year, Paul Bucket stood up and said that Volkswagen is losing... Seven thousand pounds on every EV that it makes. Is that still the case? Um, and if so, uh, when do you expect that to 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 sort of break even at least or go into profits? Um, and then I asked Mike this earlier, and you kind of touched on it a bit. But from a company car perspective, what what sort of incentives do you think that the government needs to put in place to ensure that more uh, company car drivers can go electric, please. The, um, the first point, um, you know, 
the automotive business is and has always been a scale game. Um, and therefore, in, in, order, in order to be uh, profitable in our industry, you need to build lots and lots of units and amortize the, the cost of development across as many units as you, as you possibly can. So I think you know, in making the, the commitment with the MEB platform, um, just short of 70 fully electric models by 2028, 22 million vehicles to be produced, it gives you an idea of the scale of commitment and scale in, in our industry is, is, the way, uh, is, is the way to be profitable. Also, Dr. Deese has made MEB available to external organizations if they would like, which gives the opportunity for other people to, to benefit from scale effects, which will, you know, will, will, help, the, uh, will, will help the economic equation. So that's the, that, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing on, on, uh, on company car taxation, really, I think our view is, is, around, is around consistency. So we, you know, we get we get to a point. Well, we're at a point now where the range of the EVs that are available are suitable for the vast, vast majority of uh, of driving use of driving applications. So now we now what we need is to ensure that people at the point that they're choosing their EV, if they're a fleet driver, they know what the benefit in kind taxation is going to be over the life of the uh, life of the lease of the car. Easy for me to say. Um, and I think the other thing that's important is we do recognise that. Um, the majority of, char of charging will take place at home. Number two is likely to be the workplace. Um, and therefore, understanding and being consistent in terms of the, the capital allowance structure for workplace charging infrastructure, I think, is also, also really, really important. Hmm. Uh, anyone else want to take that? or no? That's, that's, I, I would, yeah, I would yeah. just absolutely reiterate those points. I think when we see businesses that are thinking about taking EVs, benefit and kind tax is a challenge. We also specialise in salary sacrifice, which is where you can do it out of your gross salary as an employee. And that also suffers from the same issue right now. Uh, and and Fred, it's, it would be great to have that kind of visibility. It would be fantastic. I think totally to your point as well in terms of infrastructure, consistency of supporting home charging, workplace charging is really important. And also, I mean, public charging, to your point earlier, it's great to see BW rolling out with Tesco. You know, and to your point earlier, there's... 8,700 8, locations where you can charge up, public locations where you can charge up your EV today. There's 8,400 petrol stations. So already there, with having more places you can charge up your EV publicly, then you can fill up your petrol or diesel car. But even having said that, most people are going to charge at home anyway. So let's continue to support that, but actually workplace and home charging is really important in getting that consistency with benefit and kind. Yeah. Okay, uh, throw it out again to anyone who wants to ask anything. Yep, John, right down here. Here we go. Um, Fiona mentioned earlier about the uh, the long lead time on lots of the electric vehicles. So, and and, and going on to what Alex was saying about amortising the the equipment, have the car manufacturers either got the forecast completely wrong about how many EVs would be needed? Or is there some vested interest in keeping ICEs on the road for a little bit longer because of the supply chain? Uh, shall I go first? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, the, fir the first thing that I'm, I'm going to say is that I checked this morning, e-golf in the country available in free stock. We've got about two months supply for immediate delivery. So volkswagen.co.uk forward slash find a dealer. <laughs> is, you know, we, can, we can supply today. Um, so I, I appreciate that, uh, that there's been some concern in the marketplace regarding availability of, of EV supply. Um, I can only talk about the business that I'm responsible for and I feel that we're in a good spot at the moment, um, personally, personally speaking. Um, I th if, you, if you project forward, if you look at the emissions targets which are late, uh, legislated for in European legislation through to 2030, then mathematically, it's very difficult to see any other way of achieving it than to have a substantial electric vehicle mix on, uh, you know, in terms of mix of sales by, by 2030. Um, some people would, would probably do the maths and come up with a figure of around 40% of EV, 40% uh, uh, of, of car sales in Europe by, uh, by 2030 being, being electric vehicles. Um, I think that uh, you know, with with any new technology, it takes it takes time to develop. Um, but if you again, if you work backwards from 2050, if if we say we've made the commitment at Volkswagen Group that we're going to be net, uh, 
carbon zero by 2050. So you have to have, say, should we say 10 years for fleet renewal. That takes you back to 2040. So 2040 is about the time that we're going to be selling our last internal combustion engine vehicle. If you then look at your engineering capability, a platform lasts about two life cycles, so that's 16 years. So already, if you work backwards from 2050, the carbon neutrality in 2050, you're already talking about today, you know, the, the finishing of development of internal combustion engine platforms and technology. So when, when the question was regard to vested interests, if we're planning for 2050 carbon neutrality, then already today we're making the decisions about mm. investment or lack of investment, ceasing investment in internal combustion engine platforms. So, you know, that's that's where we are. Hopefully, that provides a bit of a bit of an answer. Ian, is there a supply problem? I mean, we can get a VW. We've heard that loud and clear. But I mean, m more widely, because there is a lot of well, there, I've seen quite recent publicity, isn't there, about the question of of whether there is a supply to meet a, or to encourage a demand, as it were? I think it's, it's uh, without doubt that many brands are facing a, a challenging situation of supply of their latest EVs. I think the, the good thing there is that demand for those cars is very high. They're great cars. Um, they're fun to drive, as we said. I think we've got past that now. We're seeing roughly 30 of the 80 or so cars coming into the UK market this year that are either hybrid of some sort or pure electric. So there's a great sort of arrival of small, large luxury uh, models that fit every requirement. The demand being so high, unfortunately, they're turning quickly. They're leaving showrooms quickly. They're also some of the fastest turning used cars. The demand there is equally extremely, extremely high. Mm. The Leaf and the Zoe have been some of our fastest mm. selling cars. Mm. So definitely there's a challenge there. I think the exchange rate, the Brexit uncertainty is equally. Those things don't help manufacturers level of certainty about which which markets perhaps to put those uh, those vehicles into when the UK isn't perhaps the most attractive compared to some others. So hopefully we can sort that out. We've talked about it enough, I think, today, and give greater it. certainty yeah. to bring those cars into the market because consumers want them. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to ad address that point? I, I think the battery issue, it's, it's very important for us to recognize today. Okay. I came 20 years ago from Motorola. Those of who were old enough still remember that brand Motorola. <laughs> There are points in the Motorola life that we were not able to ship phones. Not because we didn't have the electronics, but we didn't have the batteries. I think we will see that replicate itself again in the automotive environment, where the battery is becoming more and more important, and getting access to that is very important. So there are more factories being built today, and I was told this morning that's going to be about 1,732 gigawatt hour available by the end of this century, uh, 2020. Okay, that's a lot of batteries. But then the distribution, okay, whether Volkswagen gets them, whether it's Audi, whether it's going to be Mercedes who gets a battery, it's going to be a little bit of a, a dogfight in terms of fighting for the batteries. Mm. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a dogfight in terms of who gets them in terms of manufacturing. The but prioritization. Then also there's, a, there's a global game, I think, as well. So when you look at um, some research, that, uh, some forecasts that Bloomberg New Energy Finance did about 18 months ago, they had these uh, expected uptake of EV across different geographic areas. And actually, I think it was China that changed some of their policies. And pretty much overnight, Bloomberg New Energy Finance switched <laughs> a load of the supply of EVs to China because China's rolling out loads mm -hmm. of them, right? I mean, phenomenal numbers of buses. I can't even remember the stats. You'll know them much better than me. But I mean, to compare to what we're doing here, we're doing an absolutely tiny fraction. We did, we're doing 300 buses in London versus in China, 50,000. 50, Slight 000. difference, 50,000. And, and so when you've got incentives in those kind of countries, actually you're going to see you know, EVs and batteries going to those places, and then there's much fewer to go around the rest of us. Yeah, OK. Uh, gentlemen next. Here we go. Has anybody um, analysed the sustainability of getting the lithium and other trace elements needed for these batteries? I mean, presumably the supply of that is, is finite. Yeah. Sustainability, of, I mean, it, it, it is an issue, that the, the, the mining of it and the shipping of it. I get asked that question quite a bit, and we talk about it at the board meeting quite a bit, okay? The way that we're looking at things right now, the available mine, the available capacity today, will carry us past 2050. Okay, that's the available today. 
for the new mines being discovered right now. How sustainable are they beyond 2050? That's beyond me. I wish I had the crystal ball. Is it, does anyone know of research being, I mean, presumably people are looking at how it is sustained after 2050. Otherwise, I have a lot of rubby useless Well, the question right now is whether lithium continue to be the, the element of choice beyond 2050. There are new technology being invented, being, 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 being innovated right now as we speak. We have 5,000 chemists just working in our labs, working on new formulation. I mean, uh, the, the uh, fuel cell, for example, could it be the next generation of batteries available? So there's a lot of solutions out there and whether lithium is going to be the primary source by 2050, that's a question mark. And there's also substantial research going into ensuring that the minimum quantities are used. So if you take, you know, if you take the amount of cobalt that's currently used by weight in the cathode of, a, of an EV battery, you know, there are, there, we're confident that we'll make substantial reductions in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the amount of cobalt needed um, as, as, technology, uh, as, as technology improves. Uh, there's also mm -hmm. substantial research going on into the recyclability of, of lithium batteries. And uh, so there's, there's, there are opportunities uh, that we don't necessarily have at the moment that we're, we're confident that we'll have in the future. Mm. Okay, yes, lady down here, if we can <coughs> hold on just one second. Yeah, here we go. Thank you. Uh, Clem Calton from Octopus Energy. Um, this is to you, Justin, and uh, also to Alex. Do you think that uh, SMMT in, uh, is uh, playing the leadership role that we need in getting ourselves to a, um, you know, the future of autom automation in, in this country? Uh, and, and are we going there fast enough? Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know, the SMMT uh, is a very, very valuable organisation for us in the in, in the UK. It gives us it gives us an opportunity to discuss uh, and discuss very uh, very openly the um, what we all uh, what we all think is is needed. Um, I think that the SMMT has a very very productive um, relationship with with government in terms of representing the the uh, the interests of the industry. If you, uh, it's it's no different from from any representative organisation that if you are uh, representing a diverse group of individuals, then by definition it's almost impossible to to represent uh, re represent those um, interests in a uh, I guess in a uh, in a way that would satisfy every member all of the time. Um, but in terms of balancing the interests of their members and keeping a really open dialogue with with key stakeholders, then I think they do a great job, yeah. Mm. Well, I've been asked two questions directly today. Do I think Brexit was a good idea? Uh, uh, and, and now do I think the SMMT is a wonderful organization? Uh, I prefer to answer the second than the, <laughs> <laughs> than the first. It is w one of the things that, is, that is, um, the SMMT does do, and I know this from my program, where I see uh, Mike quite often in the very early morning sitting across from me is get to the places where people are having these discussions. And it is obviously vital. Um, and that's kind of why I brought up this business of fund of drive, because it does seem to me that there needs to be, you know, anyone who is, who is plugging anything um, needs to be aware of, and, and you know, we've, we've talked about uh, age group when it comes to what you think fun is, uh, and that's certainly up for discussion. I fully accept that fun to someone buying a car now is probably about the connectivity of the car rather than the wind in your hair or whatever. <laughs> but but um, that there is this real sense of, of persuading people that they're not being lectured. And, uh, and what works in broadcasting and in the media generally is that kind of conversation where you're infusing people. So... You know, I'm completely neutral and I don't belong to the SMT, but it seems to me that any organization, I'd give the advice to anyone plugging anything, you need to be out there having the conversation. And from the uh, amount of times that I see Mike in the early morning, uh, he, certainly, he certainly is. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, right at the back and then we'll go over to the corner. Thank you. Uh, Chris Aylett, I'm interested in the panel's view 
about the full life cycle of the battery uh, choice. And when that full li life cycle from cradle to grave, from the mine to the disposal of the batteries becomes more widely known and perhaps the CO2 uh, effect that it's having, it may not be the vehicle of choice. And that's what I'm, I'm concerned when that becomes more publicly known. And then I tag on to that when it's known more widely that the source of these materials is in the control of one particular nation predominantly. Uh, I'm just interested in the, in the panel's views. Yeah, okay, hold that thought. And there was someone over there as well who had a, yes, lady up in the, in the corner there, if we can go to her, and we'll take the two together. Hi, George Coles from What Car and Auto Car. Um, actually, my question is entirely different. I want to take it back to the consumer, yeah. because actually all of us in this room will be widely agreeing with a lot of the comments the panel have been making, but actually we have to think about the fact that there's a lot of people out there who have to buy these cars and we cannot afford to get it wrong in the way we got it wrong with the communication around diesel um you know most people would never have a clue what the hell euro six was man on the street no idea um so i wonder whether our industry is at a point a bit like when paul polman in 2010 said right i'm launching the sustainable living plan fantastic stake in the ground for Unilever. But ultimately, again, for the person in the street, what they know is not Unilever, they know Dove, and they c connect emotionally. So I've got yeah. two questions. One is, um, do you think with the next generation's growing awareness of the ethics of brands, which is what the business we're all in in terms of selling cars, do you think that the consumer will in future want to buy from those companies who do, as Alex was just talking about, I'm delivering a car to you which is already, you know, net zero, your job now, you know, you have a role to play in this now, you consumer. Do you think people will understand that and want to buy from those companies who are behaving in the way that they yeah. want them to behave? And the second question is, given as, and agree with Ian entirely, you know, all of our research suggests the same, that consumers very confused, whose job is it to make this really, really simple for the consumer? Because whilst there are many people dying to get their hands on an electric car, those are what I would call the early adopters. If we need to take this to mass, and thinking about Chris sitting over there, you know, this is, we've got to get the majority of people on board with this. So it's got to be simplified. And whose job is that? Ben, do you want to take those 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 last two, and then we'll turn back to the um, uh, to, to the business of the life cycle? Sure, I'm going to tackle your last one first, actually, in terms of whose job is it to get the message out there and to make it easy and simple. And and quite honestly, you know, the the population still looks to the car, the big car manufacturers that they've known for years and that they love, and they and they have strong affiliations because you know we've been like the car manufacturers have been getting people on their journeys from A to B for absolutely forever. But at the minute, when you walk into a dealer, unfortunately, a lot of them don't have good education on electric cars, on charging, on how they might charge up with renewable energy and that kind of stuff. In fact, sometimes I walked into one and got told a 30 kilowatt hour battery was going to take me 30 hours to charge at home, which was very sad, which for those of you that know, I mean, the worst case on a three pin plug, that would have taken 10 hours. I mean, it was just nonsense. And then they were like, hey, and have you seen this amazing petrol car right here that's brilliant for families? We've got a fantastic offer on it right now. I'm like... Oh, that's so sad, because actually we've got a real responsibility here now to take customers on a journey and help them through that. But I, I recognise there's a big ask there, because actually there's a lot of people that work in this industry in those dealer groups, or whether it's on, on digital sites, whether it's content, all that kind of stuff. And so actually there's a lot of work to do to get people up to speed on that. And, uh, and I think the sooner we do that, the better, so that we can help those consumers through that. Uh, I was on life cycle. I knew you were going to pick me for that question. <laughs> so far, all the research that I have received indicated the net zero is still a game in terms of whether it's going to be the right choice for energy propulsion. Okay, I understand there's been a lot of concern about mining the lithium, the processing of the lithium. I mean, we can go into a five-hour discussion with that. But all the reports that I've gotten so far, it's a game. That is all we have time for. A huge round of applause here for our panel. Uh, we've overrun because they were so interesting. <laughs>